Hey y'all, Data Guy here. Uh, and today I wanted to make a video for y'all on just kind of the 10 most popular Python packages for just getting started with machine learning and AI. Um, since, you know, ML and AI, and it's basically just uh, data science on steroids. Data science uses a lot of Python. AI and ML use a ton of Python. Um, so knowing some of the key players, key libraries that you might be using uh, is just really great to give you a playbook of, hey, how do I get started? What are the actually good tools out there? Because these days there's a ton of crap in the water. Um, there's a lot of, you know, attention grabbing AI tools that are, you know, hey, this is really useful, yada, yada, yada. Tech it behind them might not be actually there. So I wanted to go through, you know, 10 of the really battle tested, you know, these are might be a little bit on the older end, but really good basic kind of toolkit of uh, ML and AI tools with Python that you can use to, you know, get started developing. Uh, and the reason why I chose Python is I figured this is the easiest, uh, you know, to actually just get started as an independent developer, because you don't really require access to any kind of cloud platform. These are all things that you can just run on your local machine. And the first one I have for you is TensorFlow. Um, and so this actually was a brainchild of Google Brain, ironically enough. So, you know, that's why you have things like deploying large language models on Android. Uh, and this is really a heavyweight, you know, champion of ML libraries. Um, this has the scale and the complexity that can really manage, you know, production grade ML workflows. Um, it's flexible, it's got tons of different tools, it's got a really robust community. Um, and so you can do things like, you know, numerical computation or, you know, Today, Google actually developed this initially to uh, use with Google Photos to sort your pictures based on you know what's actually included in them. So TensorFlow is actually powering the image recognition systems um, underneath the hood that are like you know hey you know this image contains a uh, stop sign or this image contains you know your 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 grandfather. Um, so it really is built to handle Google grade complexity, Google grade. Um, use cases. So if you're looking to, you know, get really complex, do something like, you know, vision sensing, check out TensorFlow. It's really, really useful. And then kind of competing with uh, TensorFlow, you know, you have the good old Google meta rivalry. You have PyTorch, um, which is really focused on, you know, flexibility, a bit, you know, just kind of similar to TensorFlow. They are honestly very similar. You know, they both are doing things with a lot of, you know, numeric computation. Uh, but this was born at the Facebook's AI research lab. Um, and so it's a little bit newer. Uh, you know, you definitely have them kind of, you know, competing with Google to get the hearts and minds of the developers. Uh, you can see, you know, you can get started locally on whatever machine you're using. Um, and there's a ton of different tutorials and resources for you on, you know, how to get started with PyTorch. Um, and the signature feature for this um, is, you know, having dynamic computation graphs. Um, and But it really, what it's all about is user friendliness and flexibility. Um, so as you can see here, you have really rich, um, you know, kind of example data here. I would say better than TensorFlow, um, but, you know, that's just me. I haven't really gone super deep in either of these. Um, and so really useful tool for getting started with some of the more complex use cases, or if you're doing things like neural networks, um, image recognition, then definitely recommend this checking this out if TensorFlow doesn't scratch your itch, or if you're just a meta slave. And it wouldn't be a list of Python tools for ML and AI without the grandfather of them all, Scikit-Learn. Um, so Scikit-Learn is kind of a, you know, entry-level lightweight tool for machine learning and AI. Um, and it has a ton of different, just easy to use models, easy to use kind of templates for that you can just plug your data in and have it generate, you know, use things like random forest classifier. Um, you can see, you know, I have all these different algorithms available to me via scikit-learn. Um, and while it might not have the complexity or, you know, kind of the support for distributed computing or really large scale workflows, it is a really, really great tool for starting out. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone in AI ML and ML that didn't at least uh, start out using scikit-learn um, as their test toolkit. So if you're just, you know, on the cusp of starting your data or ML and AI journey, really recommend Scikit-Learn. It has just a ton of different tools um, and it's really, really simple to get installed, uh, to get started with and to actually start getting some value out of. And so really, really love it. And next on the uh, journey is Keras, which is a toolkit that is basically provides you an API for deep learning. Um, so instead of you needing to actually develop your own neural network framework for running your uh, workflows, you can actually have Keras 
manage all the underlying infrastructure, manage how that model gets deployed, um, and you just focus on the actual logic of the model. Um, and so this works on top of TensorFlow. So it makes deep learning as really as hassle free by really providing you know, just a high level API around TensorFlow, allowing you to manage you know, maybe the individual TensorFlow training actions, but distribute them across many computing, many different computers with deep learning, you know, you're constantly iterating over the same sets of data um, and carers can manage, you know, hey, after you've done one training job, go right back at it. We want to start another training job and just kind of manage, hey, when you're in that deep learning state without needing to have a human constantly be monitoring and triggering these new jobs, uh, you have Keras and this simple to use API to actually just say, hey, plug in, trigger the deep learning job and Keras kind of takes care of the actual underlying management of it and just remove some of the manual uh, labor out of, I guess, manual labor, annoying labor, I should say, um, out of actually deploying, you know, your TensorFlow jobs or using really annoying uh, APIs. So this gives you a better option. Um, and then numbers five and six, I'll kind of combine together because in my opinion, you don't really have one without the other. And that is pandas and NumPy. Um, so pandas is just a really, really the backbone of data manipulation in Python and provides the ability to, you know, have data sets. I won't go too deep in because I imagine everyone knows what pandas is. Um, it has, a, you know, obviously tons of support behind it. It is really the backbone of, you know, hey, getting started with working with data, manipulating it um, within Python. So, you know, I can take a, the key concept is the data frame um, where you can convert, you know, let's say an array or a dictionary into data to, uh, data frames, which almost act like SQL tables, but you can, you know, manipulate them Pythonically. Um, and then on top of that, and where you'll typically see uh, NumPy come in, or sorry, NumPy, because I'll get flamed in the comments. So NumPy, uh, <laughs> this is really, you know, more of the mathematic level um, around pandas. Um, so this is just gives you things like random number generators, uh, you know, just a lot of things like, hey, I want to create a random integer, I want to, you know, have, you know, standard mathematical functions like a power law function. Um, and so NumPy or NumPy provides all the different mathematical complexity um, and also provides support for larger multiple dimensional arrays and matrices. So you can build on top of pandas, give it, you know, more complexity as well as give it more tools to help you perform, you know, really high level transformations, complex mathematical transformations. Um, and then a lot of tools also build off of NumPy as well, um, where they then use NumPy's kind of framework of, hey, you know, I have access to things like random number generators um, and using those to improve their own processes. So really is kind of a backbone for really any scientific computing in uh, Python. Then after you've done, uh, you've gotten your data and pandas data frames, you've done some tra or calculations with NumPy, you'll need a place to visualize it. And that's where matplotlib comes in. Um, and so this is really a tool for creating all these different kinds of plots and images. You can see all these different templates here where you can take your data, take your raw data and say, hey, make a box plot out of this. Uh, you can customize that plot's characteristics like its color all in code. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility with how you want to visualize your data and a lot of different options to do so, so that you don't have to figure out how to convert your own data into a visual format. Um, so really, really useful tool, you know, when at the end of the day, you need to take those raw calculations and turn them into a report for some exec to actually look at. Now, coming in at number eight, we have NLTK, which is a natural language toolkit. Um, and this is a really great tool for, you know, just giving you the ability to take raw text, have NLTK look at it, process it, tokenize it, and give you a perform sentiment analysis on it. So instead of, you know, you needing to read the raw, uh, data into your ML model, you can have NLTK say, hey, what was the sentiment of this uh, Twitter comment? What was the sentiment of these uh, support calls? And then have that sentiment score be what actually informs you know, your predictions rather than whatever uh, words were involved in that comment, because you could have misaligned correlations there. You know, if you say, hey, every time someone mentioned uh, bug, you know, it, it equals, you know, negative uh, 1000 revenue. Uh, that example got a little bit away from me, but this is just a really, really great toolkit for making it easy for you to, you know, take any kind of uh, text data and then transcribe it, create either tokens out of it and get information on what that sentiment is and then use that to train models um, and really just manipulating text and breaking it down into an easy to use format uh, with ML and AI tools. This is your one-stop shop. Now coming in at number nine, uh, you have OpenCV, um, and that is Open Computer Vision, which is just a massive computer vision library. So it has tons of different algorithms and things to recognize, you know, images, give you your own toolkit to actually build your own um, open 
real-time computer vision recognition systems. So, you know, this is where you can do things like TikTok uses this to apply those fun filters, right? Uh, this is OpenCV. I don't know if OpenCV is actually driving TikTok, but platforms like that are driving it. Um, so really cool technology, definitely something, you know, you'll need to be a little bit experienced in uh, just ML and AI in general, and obviously computer vision, if you want to get value out of it, you know, it is very powerful, but with great power comes great complexity. And so you can see like even how to scale or scan it one image, uh, you have quite a bit of learning to do. So it is really useful, um, but it is quite a steep learning curve until I think, you know, you'll, the average person will get value for it. Uh, but if you know, you're trying to create your own facial recognition system, check out OpenCV. Um, that's going to be your best place to start. And then finally, to tie it all together, just as I feel this tool ties all of your AI and ML together, you have Seaborn. Um, so Seaborn, you can kind of think of just as a improved and upgraded matplotlib. So you have a lot more flexibility in your know, colors, the way you want to format things, um, and just generally expanded more different types of graphs. You can kind of see, you know, example galleries in here. I can go to a joint plot and you can see, you know, the code here of how you would create it, where you have, you know, both this hex plot and some bars on the side. I don't even know how to read this, but, you know, here it is. Um, so this is when you finally need to present your findings, you need to you know, give it a little extra pizzazz, check out Seaborn, uh, it can help get you there. And that is all I have on the docket today for different Python libraries I wanted to cover. Hope you enjoyed this video, hope you found some value out of it, and above all else, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out, peace.